beautiful day out there. It reminds me of a, a day I was uh, on top of a tower in Texas. It was a bit colder than 1997 in January. And the uh, the fellow who had brought me up to the top of the radio tower and had built me in, so I, I had to trust him. Uh, I was saying that kind of nervously, what a uh, beautiful day it is, and he said, oh darn it, every day is a beautiful day. Beautiful day to be alive. So I just thought that's, that's a good attitude for somebody that's, uh, whose lives uh, depend on his good work and, and people like me depend on his good work too. So it's uh, really nice to be up here, uh, nice all day. Spent about an hour, hour 15 minutes, uh, talking about a subject close to my heart and how I uh, found out about it. Uh, with writers, one thing leads to another. Started in 1979, and you might say one article has led, or connect directly, another article and another book. So I'll explain how I got interested in the subject of Arthur Woods. To, uh, I first have to kind of take you back. Uh, Think of New York in 1914. That will be the grounding for this piece. Uh, there are no sound recordings of what New York sounded like. Not until 1947. Uh, there were recording machines, but nobody actually went on the street to find out, uh, record what it sounded like. But imagine church bells and a lot of steam whistles, uh, vendors on the street. Uh, that's how they sold Victrolas. Uh, street corners, you hear Victrolas playing all day long. Quite obnoxious, really. And uh, those Awuga horns, very loud place. And nobody had air conditioning, so everybody had the windows open. It was a noisy place, and people, frankly, didn't get a lot of sleep. This was the time of Arthur Woods. To explain how I got into this subject, he's a pretty obscure guy. Has anybody ever heard of Arthur Woods before? Raise your hands. Before this? Not surprised. A couple, a couple of them had heard of Arthur Woods, but he's pretty much confined to policing history and um, not even really emergency management literature. So it'll be my pleasure to introduce you to uh, this amazing guy. Uh, here's how I got connected to this. Um, as Mike mentioned, I did a book called Inviting Disaster, and that came out the week before 9-11. So um, after the buildings went down, uh, the publisher asked me to do another chapter, so I began looking at a particular angle of interest. And I got interested in the rescue of course, there were controversies about the helicopters on the roof. And at first, I was going to look at, well, should they have tried it? And then I realized uh, helicopter pilots are the pilots in command, and it's no point to try to question their judgment. So I thought, I'm not going there. Uh, that was their call. Instead, I began to look at, well, whose helicopters were these anyway? And I was struck by the fact that they were not the FDNY's helicopter. Very unusual. Uh, nearly all cities it's some form of emergency management usually connected to the fire department. Not in New York. Well, how could this be? Uh, this particular helicopter, uh, there were two kinds, there were Port Authority there, and then also uh, um, uh, NYPD, Aviation Unit. So I began looking into that. Well, how did this happen? And it led me back to Arthur Woods, who decided, and I'll talk about this at length, that rescue and emergency management was critical to the function of the New York police, which was not a standard way of thinking, and he had reasons for that. And I'll explain uh, what those reasons were, but that's what got me interested in the subject of uh, Arthur Woods. In the meantime, I went ahead and did an article, uh, or did an article, and then a book on the helicopters. And so you might say I, I got two subjects of interest following 9-11. One was helicopters and what they can do and then also our woods. There's a picture of him. Um, he was uh, 44 when he started in the NYPD on April 8, 1914. And he was commissioner, being the head of the New York Police Department. But before I spend a lot of time uh, um, going into his uh, biography, I have to give you some of that prehistory. And in 1914, uh, the subject, the word disaster was really a very common one. I mean, you'll find thousands of references to that word in the literature all the way back to the early 1700s. Disaster means bad star. Well, bad star or, or dark star, you might say, it's that flip side of technology. The more advanced the technology, the more powerful it is, disasters seem to come in their train. And that includes not just steam engines and uh, locomotives, and, but also things that fall down. 
one of which was the Lisbon earthquake of November 1st, 1755. <clears throat> and I studied uh, uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau in college, but they never told us about the Lisbon earthquake and what a profound influence it had on Western thought and eventually on emergency management. Uh, have you all ever heard of the poem called uh, The Wonderful one Hoss Shade? It talked about a, um, uh, a carriage built in such a wonderful way that it held together and then fell apart to flinders a hundred years later. Everything fell apart at the same time. And that was keyed to uh, November 1st, 1755. The simply a titanic earthquake. And you don't really think of Portugal as uh, having a problem with Portugal. This was uh, one of the fourth biggest ever known in world history. Totally destroyed the center of Lisbon, followed by a five-day fire. It was, it was wrenching beyond anything you can imagine in today's time. And I, I have to say that includes 9-11 because it happened on All Saints Day when the churches were packed with people. At the same moment they were packed with people, they fell down on them, killing over 12,000 people, including hundreds of nuns and monks. Sixty churches destroyed, dozens of monasteries, and people died. Is there a God? That's pretty much the question they had. There was, a, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the figure that arrived, uh, came out of this uh, when I uh, influence on Arthur Woods. Of course, there's also the Chicago fire. Not many casualties, but destroyed 16,000 buildings. The Johnstown flood caused by the uh, destruction of the dam. Um, lots and lots of steam and power explosions. That's that dark side of the technology. Uh, literally hundreds of those a decade of steam, uh, steam engine explosions. And of course, bridge failures like the Ashton uh, River. So here's the uh, philosophy they had. Um, which is, as far as emergency management, well, we'll just wait till something happens, because it might not. Um, after 1755, most people went to thinking back uh, that it was fate. And, uh, and the Marquis of Pombal, uh, who was the hero at uh, um, picking up after Lisbon, uh, he was a pretty business-like guy. And somebody said, what do we do now? Many thousands of people buried under the rubble. Uh, he said, what next? Well, we bury the dead and feed the living. It's as simple as that, let's get to work. Uh, really the first man who did emergency management, not really in anticipating so much as picking up the pieces. And it became so revolutionary what uh, the Marquis did, his name also known by Carvalho de Mello, uh, Carvalho de Mello, is that he pretty much took over the government for the next 20 years. He used that earthquake as a way to reform government and to move Portugal into a new century. But so often, this was unusual, so often the local response totally swamped. And then in the U.S., they, people just waited for the feds to come in. And they always declared martial law, and uh, they did what they could to pick up the pieces. Pretty chaotic, really. Again, nobody anticipated that this would really happen anytime soon, not in their lifetime. And until Arthur Woods, nobody said, okay, we've got a big city. We are sure to have disasters. If not on my watch, then at least I can prepare for those on whose watch it happens. <coughs> so when we come to 1914, there had been even fresher disasters that were influencing the thinking in New York. <coughs> and uh, really five of them come to mind, all big. Uh, Galveston Hurricane killed about 8,000, of course, in the news lately with the uh, uh, latest destruction in Galveston. Fire on the uh, General Slogan, the steamer, killed a thousand people. Uh, Baltimore City Fire, the fire didn't really kill that many, but it uh, destroyed 1,500 buildings. The San Francisco earthquake and the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire. And so the thought process began, um, really in Arthur Woods, is I don't like the pattern I'm seeing, which is the locals can't really handle this, and they just sort of wait around and, and uh, trying to handle the riots or the looting until the federal government comes in. And what if the federal government isn't available? And this was a very pertinent question in 1914 as the war approached World War I. So many fewer things taken for granted in the Arthur Woods era. In fact, almost nothing taken for granted. This was a city that was growing like crazy had grown by 40-fold since 1800. And everybody's still 
as far as Manhattan, crammed on that island. It wasn't growing much in landfill by that time. And it had, instead of Manhattan, as it, New York City used to be, now it had five boroughs. So it had grown both in population and 